In this video, I'll be demonstrating how a breadboard can affect a Schmidt trigger circuit. I used a 7414 logic chip which contains six inverters with Schmidt trigger inputs. I wanted to use a Schmidt trigger inverter to turn an arbitrary waveform into a clipped square wave. The problem is some ringing that I was seeing at the edges of the square wave. My microcontroller will be counting edges, and I'd prefer to send it clean edges so it doesn't double or triple count on glitches. This is the Schmidt trigger inverter chip. I'm only using one gate at the moment. It's the lower left gate. Its input is pin 1, and its output is pin 2. My oscilloscope is plugged into pin 2. Both pin 1 and 2 are plugged into the breadboard. Let's see what we get on the oscilloscope. The top trace is the input, and the bottom trace is the output of the Schmidt trigger. Notice the glitches in the input. These are being caused by the switching of the output. Now let's take a look at the circuit when we have the output unplugged from the breadboard. Here I have it connected directly to my oscilloscope probe. With this configuration, the glitches are still there, but they're much less severe. Now let's go back to the situation where both pins were plugged into the breadboard. And this time, let's vary the amplitude of the sine wave. You can see the glitches still exist on the input, which are caused by the output. Now I'm going to zoom in and take a look at the edge. The bottom trace here is the one of the edges of the output square wave. And you can see there's a kind of a, a ringing on the output. And its, its characteristic is changing based on the amplitude of the input sine wave. So when I increase the amplitude, it seems to have less, um, less rings or less extra cycles before it settles. Here I'm making very minor adjustments in the amplitude and there are, there are locations where it's just on the verge of getting in an extra cycle before it settles, and that's where you'll see kind of a ghost of an extra cycle. Now let's take another look at the situation where we had the output unplugged from the breadboard. Now we're back to the situation where the glitches aren't as visible on the input, and we can change the amplitude here as well. But what's really interesting is that you can change the amplitude of the input sine wave and the output doesn't have any extra cycles. It's not doing that sort of ringing thing. So for some reason, having the output unplugged fixes the issue. So why would that be? Oh, uh, on an unrelated note, um, I, I have my name written on a few of my breadboards, as you can see on the back and that's because I would take them to school. I'd take them to all the labs because the breadboards in the labs were all terrible. Like, the, yeah, there, there'd be so many broken connections inside the breadboards, and there'd be loose connections, and they'd be, like, melted in several places, and they were really awful. So, you know, I mean, you you learn, the, the first couple labs, you know, you learn, oh, the breadboard's not perfect, but, uh, but after the first couple times learning that, it's enough. So, this is what the inside of a breadboard looks like. Each of these pieces of metal has five connections that you can shove a wire into, and all of the connectors are parallel to each other. So, the model in my head says that between each of these connectors, there is some capacitance, because you have pieces of metal near each other separated by air, or when, when it's in the breadboard, it'll be separated by whatever plastic material is in there, so you'll probably end up with some capacitance. You might hear people refer to this as a parasitic capacitance, because it's not really desired exactly, it's more of a uh, in most cases, it's an unintentional result of how the breadboard was constructed. I don't think anyone wants small capacitors between every adjacent pin. Maybe someone does. So when the input and output pins are both plugged into the breadboard, it could be modeled as such, with a capacitor between the output and the input. 
and I don't really want that. So I think what I'll end up doing is migrating this design onto something else. Um, one thing that you can do is you can solder together your circuit on top of a piece of uh, copper clad fiberglass, which is what I have here. And these work pretty good. A lot of those parasitic capacitances can be eliminated, uh, particularly between pins. There will still be some capacitance between the pins and the ground plane of the board, but um, in this case, that's less of a problem than capacitance between pins. I hope you enjoyed the video. I also hope you learned a little bit about the nuances of building a circuit on a breadboard. And now that we have a better understanding of parasitic capacitances inside a breadboard, we can make better informed decisions when we make our next digital circuit. Perhaps it won't be on a breadboard. Thanks for watching. See you next time.